In the far south of the Pacific Ocean lie the wind-swept Chatham Islands, home to the world's most formidable predators, great white sharks. They've been long feared as lone hunters striking at random, but here, a pattern of local attacks suggests that the sharks are living and hunting in packs. The prospect of these dread predators living like undersea wolves brings scientists and local divers together to track down the true nature of the beast. Of almost 400 known species of sharks, the Great White stands out, notorious as the ultimate killing machine, a roving oceanic assassin that attacks out of nowhere. Its reputation is built on 400 million years of evolution that has honed its senses and its biology. Most fish are cold-bodied, but the white shark keeps critical areas of its body warmed Instead of being lost to the sea, heat generated by deep muscle activity is recycled and warms incoming blood, keeping the shark's core up to 60 degrees warmer than the water. It boosts the shark's metabolism like a turbo engine to give great whites 45% more power than similar sized fish. Warming the shark's brain increases the capacity to process information from a battery of super sensors, such as a huge taste and smell organ, able to home in on prey from a mile away, and a network of hair-lined canals sensitive to the merest vibration in the water. Electrical senses that can actually track the nerve activity of prey. The heat-assisted super senses make the Great White a predator without parallel and its warm body means it can thrive even here in the chilled South Pacific, where Antarctic currents make the sea especially productive. In a single day, top divers here can land a harvest with a street value upwards of $40,000. Abalone is in such high demand on international markets. To protect against overfishing, divers are banned from using scuba or other breathing aids. They can work only as long as they can hold a single breath and must shuttle constantly between the seabed and their support boat. While on the seabed, a diver is relatively safe. But every journey to the surface is a gamble. White sharks typically ambush their prey from below and a surfacing diver is a sitting duck. Another shark attack in the Chatham Islands, the second in two years among the community's 40 divers. It was all fairly quick and I just knew that I had to get out of the bloody man's mouth. The biggest wound, a 30 centimetre rip, almost from his thigh to his knee. But in one leg pretty badly, and when I put myself on the naiad, I went and pulled me on the naiad, that was the first thing I checked for, that I didn't have a leg, and I realised it was just a pretty big hole. Abalone diver Kinna Scully faced three separate strikes as he struggled to the boat, which is unusual. Most great white attacks involve a single strike. Some scientists believe a great white's sophisticated taste sense quickly determines humans are not fatty enough to be worth eating. And so it spits us back out. Three strikes on one diver could suggest three separate sharks were involved. Within 10 months, there was a similar attack. The third white shark attack gives New Zealand the fifth highest attack rate in the world. Diver Vaughan Hill also faced three separate attacks before being rescued. While the bite and spit theory remains hotly debated, the multiple attacks reinforce claims by local fishermen that far from great white sharks being loners, they are hunting the island's waters in packs.
They say further evidence is provided by another pattern of terror that unfolds regularly on these remote islands. The Chathams lie 500 miles off the coast of New Zealand. They sit at the tip of a narrow finger of continental shelf, which protrudes into a deep trench used by many creatures as an oceanic highway from rich feeding grounds of the far south. Large marine mammals, such as these short fin pilot whales, are able to make such journeys because of the concentrated fat in their blubber. Blubber stores more than twice the energy of fish flesh, and white sharks are known to feed on dead whales. But some island fishermen argue that sharks do more than scavenge. They say the sharks work together to herd healthy pilot whales into bays running them aground in hundreds. Mass whale strandings like this one are a tragedy played out every year on beaches around New Zealand. For now, scientists can only speculate on the reasons. But fishermen say bite marks provide evidence of attack by numerous great whites. The idea of white sharks deliberately working in packs to herd whales is dismissed as pure speculation by many scientists who say it suggests cooperation far beyond anything white sharks are capable of. But others concede it might be possible that a pod of whales in unfamiliar shallows could be confused and panicked by great whites gathering in hope of a feeding opportunity, thereby driving the whales ashore. But the suggestion great whites may work together like a pack of undersea wolves raises questions about the risk Chatham Islanders take in diving without protection. To answer the divers' questions, top New Zealand shark scientist Craig Thorburn has come to the islands to tag and track the great whites. He's brought with him nearly a ton of equipment for an expedition that will take several months. Craig will seek the help of attack survivor Kinna Scully in a hunt for creatures that nearly ended his life. Just finding the sharks is going to be a major challenge. They remain among the most elusive and least known animals on the planet. The keys here is also a place that there. Craig's plan is to search close to seal colonies until he locates sharks he can tag. If he can tag several sharks with radio transmitters and then track them, Craig hopes their behavior will reveal whether they do hunt in packs. What he's proposing has never been done before and will take the team into unknown territory. Their first target is off a desolate rocky fortress known as the 44s. It is a staging post for legions of ocean wanderers, including one of the world's largest colonies of royal albatrosses. But the team is more interested in the island's huge colony of seals. Young seals have exceptionally high levels of blubber that may tempt adult white sharks. Here, a shark could easily blend with the rocky seabed to get close enough for an ambush. The expedition has been joined by a team of local fishermen and divers. They use the tried and proven method of chumming with fish offal to create a scent or burly trail to bring the sharks to the boat. If a shark gets close enough, Craig will use a barbed tag to attach a sonic transmitter to its back. The transmitters will send out an audio signal 
detectable over a mile away, so he can plot the shark's movements to build a profile of hunting patterns. But within 48 hours of arrival, the island's volatile weather forces them to run for home. Isolated in the open ocean, the Chatham Islands lie in the center of a weather war zone, where storms sweeping out of Antarctica collide with hot tropical air. Each year, an average of 2% of the island's tiny fishing fleet is lost in the battle. Struggling against the weather, it takes six weeks for the team to search each small island that has seal colonies. These are the obvious targets for marauding great whites. Yet, there's not a sign of a single white shark near any of them. Finally, the weather eases enough to allow the team to get to one last location, the low-lying Star Keys. They consist merely of a series of reefs that just break the sea's surface. But they're home to one of the largest seal colonies in the islands and should be an ideal hunting ground. White shark sightings are common around the colony. It was here two years ago that Kinna Scully came within an inch of losing his life. For him, it's now a place of particular dread. He's been diving since, but never here. As the waiting begins again, Craig sterilizes biopsy equipment in alcohol. As well as fitting identification and tracking tags, He's hoping to take DNA samples that may reveal family links among the sharks and help determine whether they're migratory creatures or permanent residents. So much of the nature of this beast remains unknown. Then, after six weeks frustration, success. The large adult male circles gradually closer. Under Craig's leadership, the team of fishermen have become frontier scientists. But getting close enough to attach the color-coded tracking tag proves a challenge. The shark takes the bait, but eludes the tag. However, as he disappears, a second, larger male arrives right here. and noses right here. straight at the boat. And this time, the tag finds its mark. Craig has gone face to face with many sharks, but this will be his first ever encounter with a great white. Both sharks are huge adult males. But are they the mindless monsters of folklore or cunning pack animals that hunt like wolves? Their warm bodies give them a metabolic rate probably closer to that of mammals than of fish. But does it also make them intelligent enough to hunt as a team? Then a third shark approaches, larger again. shows no fear. With three sonic tracking tags in place, the team prepares to go after DNA samples. It will be possible only as long as the sharks remain tempted by the baits. But there seems little concern. Even as the lance that would take the tissue sample is being prepared, more sharks have shown up. They now have six huge sharks around the boat, all are large mature males, 
a pack by almost any measure. The sonic tags reveal they are tracking up the Burley Trail, making erratic circuits seldom more than 100 yards from the boat or from one another. While the sharks are around, it's vital to gather all possible information. And that's best done underwater. Hey boys. Hey, my lucky wet, come on. Right, be okay. So Kinner will join Craig in the cage. Video footage will help to piece together the truth of the shark's behaviour. But the last time Kinner saw a great white up this close, he was in its jaws. This one is 18 feet long, bigger than the one he knows attacked him here two years ago. Now, seeing so many supposed solitary animals together, Kenner is convinced that he was the target of three different sharks. It's rare to see one male great white of this size. To find six huge males in one place challenges much of what we thought we knew about these sharks. It's another boy. It's the boy. Sure. Conventional belief is that they are territorial animals that only cross paths incidentally. There it is, back of the boat, swimming around the shark cage. So when the Chathams offers abundant feeding choices, why are they all at this one place? Come on, people, come on, come on, come to Papa. I only want to spin you. Good girl, good girl. Hey, you want a kiss? Oh, you're lovely. <laughs> the answer could come from DNA it may reveal that this remote island sharks are an isolated population that could have developed unique behavior patterns, including pack hunting. But as suddenly as it began, the excitement is over. Before they can study the group any further, the weather again intervenes. Trapped indoors now, week after week, the team can only go back over their findings. Their tracking data and the images caught by their underwater cameras reveal a remarkable story. Finding six male sharks together, rather than spread around the island seal colonies, defies popular belief that white sharks are solitary creatures. It would seem to reveal a level of group behavior scientists worldwide are only just beginning to suspect. The implications are as chilling to Kinner as the memory of attack. The scent trail could have drifted only a few miles from the boat. The sharks must all have been in the area already. It may just be a chance gathering, but it could also mean the sharks are working together. To find the seas they work are stalked by packs of killers is the last thing Kinner and the local divers want. Yes, Stalled by the weather, the team begins a search for other information. The shores of the main island's lagoon are bound with fossilized shark teeth, stained black by peaty soils. It's not uncommon to find discarded shark teeth. Most sharks shed and replace teeth continually through their lives, producing 20 to 40,000 in a lifetime. But here, there are even teeth from two of the greatest sharks that ever lived. The extinct auriculatus and the even larger super shark, Megalodon. Some argue that the great white shark these jaws came from competed directly with Megalodon. But while it made the great white look like a minnow, giant teeth couldn't save Megalodon when oceans cooled. And the warm-bodied great white was left as the supreme hunter of the sea. Finally, the weather allows them to renew the search for their tagged sharks. There's no way of telling where the sharks might have gone since their last encounter. It's thought they normally remain at one site only a few days, rarely as long as a week. The team must begin their search all over again.
If a tagged shark is within a mile radius, the hydrophone should pick up its signal. Over successive days, the team again checks out each of the major seal colonies on the islands. With no success. White sharks can cover 50 miles in a single day. With so many seal colonies around the islands, the search area could be a thousand square miles. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. By the time the team returns to the Star Key reefs where they spotted the fish originally, there is still no sign of any of the tagged sharks. It appears the expedition has failed. Each sonic tag gives out sound pulses of different frequencies, picked up by tuning the receiver between 390 and 400. Turning the hydrophone scans the ocean in narrow bands and picks up a telltale signal. Got him. Got him. We're about. Three, 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 three. 400. It's a 400 yeah, tag. Tuned up a bit? Yeah. He's down that way, mate. Yeah, he's definitely that way, mate. Towards around the island. Check 390 as well, mate. Oh, yeah. Tuned up a bit? Three nights is out that way. That's the one I saw. Two of the sharks, at least, are still here. The team is now able to track as the great whites patrol along the edge of the seal colony. What's it now, Craig? Out, out the other side of the break, mate, to the right of the break. That's the strongest signal. By the end of the day, all the tagged sharks are located. After three weeks, they're we all in the same area around, and still moving as a group. The signals reveal the sharks remaining within a few hundred yards of each other, patrolling an area where the reef drops into water 300 feet deep. It allows the sharks to approach unseen to within feet of the seals. Is this just a remarkable coincidence? Close, reckon, eh? Or are Craig and the team finding a pattern that has been missed in several decades of great white research? Finding similar patterns over several days could prove pack behavior, but they'll get no chance. The volatile summer is over and an unrelenting winter is descending on the islands. Craig and Kinner have come too tantalizingly close to a major breakthrough in white shark research to stop now. Instead, they decide to take their quest to the Spencer Gulf in South Australia one of the few places in the world known to have more white shark activity than the Chatham Islands. Easy access has made the Spencer Gulf the center for some of the most extensive research on great whites done anywhere. Here, they'll be able to compare their findings with one of the world's leading researchers, based at Port Lincoln. This is a gateway to the Southern Ocean and the base for a major tuna and abalone fishery. Unlike New Zealand, where fishermen are still allowed to catch a white shark a day, here, great whites are considered an endangered species and protected. But so are divers. Where New Zealand divers are forced to work without support, divers here are supplied with surface-fed air, hydraulically driven collecting cages and heated wetsuits. 
Diving methods here changed around the same time as South Australia gave protection to white sharks. With the extra technology, these divers avoid spending time in the most dangerous zone near the surface. The air supply enables them to remain safely on the seabed for prolonged periods, instead of shuttling back and forth to the surface for every breath. Overfishing of abalone is avoided by limits on the amount of the shellfish that can be taken each season. The air supply also enables a diver to fill air bags to send his catch to the surface, cutting out further perilous trips through the mid-water zone. Forced to accept that they are in the shark's domain, Australian divers have found a way to work alongside them. Ultimately, protection for Kinner Scully and the Chatham divers may lie not in studying the shark's behaviour, but in changing their own. You had a good flight? Good How's it awesome, going? Nice to meet you. At Port you Lincoln, great? Craig and Kinner team up with renowned shark expert Ian Gordon and former game fisherman Rolf Zabatsky part of a new breed of shark researchers. Weather looks pretty good, so um, I think the go is to try to get out there as quick as possible, get into the bay at North Neptune, see yeah. if we can get some burly out. In a decade of pioneering field studies, Ian Gordon has probably tagged and tracked more white sharks than any other man. It's given him a depth of field experience, usually only held by fishermen. The New Zealanders have enlisted his aid in establishing whether the unexpected pack behaviour of the Chatham sharks is a local phenomenon or maybe typical of the species. The team heads out to a rocky archipelago at the mouth of the Spencer Gulf. It's remarkably similar to the Chathams, but protected by the Australian continent, it offers more dependable weather, allowing researchers more time on the water. This is where all the baby seals are, all around here. Yeah. Right around the shore here, and this seems to produce really good white shark action in here. The Neptune Islands are breeding grounds for Australian sea lions, but also support one of the few colonies of New Zealand fur seals outside New Zealand waters. Newly weaned seal pups have twice as much blubber as adults. Their bodies are almost 50% fat and they make naive targets. While the sharks hunt seals, Ian has found they also seem to like local southern bluefin tuna, possibly because its high proportion of red muscle makes it a protein-rich alternative to seals. Tuna oil will also provide the basis for the burley, providing a scent trail that lingers in the water up to three miles down current. The very first thing the shark's going to notice is the smell from the oil slick. So the oil slick is the most important thing. That's the thing that gets it out the furthest. But as the shark gets closer, you put other cues in there to create more interest for the shark as he comes. Once sharks get closer, large tuna baits will offer a major interest. Then the researchers add tuna blood to reinforce the signals of an easy meal. Minced fish will complete the menu. Get the burly starting to happen. Here we go. Where the mince really works, as far as the burly is concerned, is you get all these little fish coming in, feeding on the burly, they're churning the water up and making noise, and their cue sounds that if there's a shark towards the back of the burly slip, he'll feel that. He'll either hear it or feel it on his lateral line and then come in. The first day is predictably quiet. But less than 24 hours after arriving, 
the pace picks up. The ritual of shark tagging is almost second nature for Ian. He targets the base of the shark's dorsal fin, where the tag will be most visible later. If possible, they'll note any distinguishing marks and behavior from below the surface as well. But as Craig heads down for his second face-to-face -face encounter with white sharks, there's a surprise in store. Again, the shark is not alone. Lurking below the surface, there's a giant mature female over 15 feet long. And she's accompanied by a group of boisterous adolescents that sweep into the boat fast and curious. On your boat. Suddenly, there are sharks everywhere. None of the animals appear to be carrying tags, so it's not a group Ian and Rolf have come across before, in spite of tagging over 100 animals off the South Australian coast. Ian will tag this group with new plastic tags that he's just developed. In the past, field studies have been hampered by reliance on tags that could only be read if the shark was caught. The new tags can be read 10 feet below the surface and without touching the shark again. Yes, we've got it. We've got him. Other cold water sharks are slow moving and unaggressive predators. But as fast as they can get baits out, the shark they call Mitch shows up again to take them. Drop the bait, drop bait, drop, drop, drop. Got it. At last, with a full belly, Mitch loses interest and the team's attention can turn to others. These younger animals offer a marked contrast to the ponderous Chatham Island adults. Oh, you lost it again! But one they name after Kinner is of similar size and age to the others, yet of markedly different character. Although far thinner, she seems barely tempted by the bait or aware of the activity around the boat. If Mitch reinforces the stereotypical image of white sharks, Kinner's manner is more cautious and calculating. She may have fed recently or may be sick, but recent studies increasingly report that white sharks are selective about what they eat. And far from the mindless eat anything machine of popular stereotype. It seems a radical new picture of white sharks is opening up. And the sonic tags Craig has brought promise to reveal far more. It'll ping um, four, five, and six. So it'll go four pings, five pings, six. The expensive sonic tags are new to shark research. They were developed for tracking high value commercial fish stocks and have seldom been used for tracking non commercial species such as white sharks. But by allowing researchers to pinpoint where sharks go when not responding to baits, they may finally reveal the great white's natural behavior patterns. Good. So, Rolf, 
Yes. You get to name this one, mate. Uh, when it, it is a female, I will t uh, c uh, call it Marguerite. Marguerite. Marguerite, after my lovely wife. Hey, good one. After flying the chum flag, warning of shark baiting for over a week, the expedition is about to move into a new phase. They now have a sonic tag in the large female adult. Come on, Mr. Sharky. Most of the trekking stuff that's been done in has been, um, like, as soon as they put the tag in, they've stopped burying it. What I'm more interested in right now is that we can actually get some, some data on whether it's hanging around in the burly slick or within a close area of the burly slick at night. Yep. And that's, I'm really keen on finding that out, you know, so. Then in the next couple of days, now we've got one, we can actually go and follow it as well. Yep. Uh, so that's even better. Current thinking is that great whites don't hunt at night. Now it may be possible to tell if Marguerite continues seeking baits or moves on to other activity. There's a listen. It's getting fainter like she's swimming down the birdie trail. Yeah, you can hear it quite clearly, but there's all of the um, static in the background. Yeah, it's going to get worse as we go into night, yeah. because the ocean will just come alive. With yeah, well, pistol shrimp and yeah. everything. It's really yeah. bad. Yeah, tracking so you can really get a good scent of her, so she's obviously off the back there somewhere. Yeah. Craig and Ian track around the clock, listening for a signal from Marguerite's sonic tag every half an hour. Degrees. For 12 hours, the giant female remains within a mile of the boat. It's exactly the same compass bearing. A strong signal. Okay, so it's, uh... But despite continual monitoring, they lose touch with her. Certainly the scent trail is not holding her at all. For all the attraction of their expensive tuna bait, Marguerite reveals no further interest in feeding at the boat, either by night or day. Over three days, she shows up in the bay in the hours before dawn only to vanish again beyond signal range. She may simply have lost interest in food. After a single meal of seal pup, white sharks seem able to go two weeks or more without striking again. But it's possible she's patrolling the margins of the seal colony just out of range. I wonder how close are they going to be patrolling around those rocks and those colonies? Well, the seals are all around these areas here, so anything's possible. You know, they can be running along deep sections trying to trying to find the occasional seal, I guess it just comes off the rocks and doesn't realise it's a shark there. On her track? Yep. Uh, no, nothing here either. Nothing. This zone at the sea's edge is where the white shark has its greatest advantage. Unlike humans, the shark's eyesight is sophisticated enough to monitor activity underwater and above. But for now, the action is back in the bay. Sharks have again been drawn to the baits. The consistency with which the hunters turn up in groups seems confirmation of the findings from the Chatham Islands. But the makeup of this group is radically different. Young males and females instead of only mature males. In fact, it soon becomes clear this is the same adolescent gang they've already tagged, back after an absence of several hours. There's no mistaking the boisterous teenager they've named Mitch. 
as aggressive as ever. But there's no sign of Marguerite with the group. Perhaps the fish schools drawn to the burly are still tempting to these younger sharks, but not to the fully mature adult. It's thought white sharks feed almost exclusively on fish for their first 12 to 15 years, and begin to hunt marine mammals as they get older, faster and smarter. The bay may be a nursery area, favoured by young sharks in the transition to adulthood. The underwater cameras reveal other behaviour that supports the pack theory. The great whites show no aggression towards each other, aside from lowering their fins in a guarded stance. It's contrary to what might be expected of lonely hunters competing for food. The team continues the vigil into a fourth night, in the hope the adult female, Marguerite, returns and confirms her place in the pack. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, one of the baits is struck. Oh, there he goes. It's out there. But the ocean giant is not Marguerite. It's a huge blue shark. as long as the great whites and the most abundant of ocean sharks. But although a match for a great white in length, the blue shark is a fraction of the weight and has none of the speed or power. Its cold body simply can't sustain the metabolic rate of the warm-bodied white shark. He really went for that bite. Marguerite and this blue shark are very different beasts. Come dawn, the team determined to find Marguerite. How about Marguerite? Well, that's well, pretty she, clean, eh? Yeah, it was a clean and tag. And she came back in. And anyway. she came straight back in again. Then she cleared yeah. off in the middle of the night. Yeah, and then so came back And then came point. back again. It's Marguerite really may have been an independent really shark simply passing through. But a group of adolescents in close again. association with a mature on, female yeah. could yeah. suggest a family yeah. grouping, yeah. much like orca or other large marine mammals. If true, it's a major advance on anything previously suspected of white sharks. To be sure, they'll have to confirm she is still around. The day is calm enough for Rolf to risk venturing around the seaward side of the island, where they'll be exposed to the full force of the Southern Ocean. But today, luck is on their side. White shark. You saw the big flash of the belly. I don't yeah. know if you can see it clear as a bell. Unbelievable. This water's so clear here on this deep side because we've got 45 metres under us. I don't know if it was a white shark we were looking for, but we've Turn heard the a sounder off for a moment. Turn the sounder off, they're off. We all heard a signal. And all of a sudden there's a white shark swimming 10 feet under the surface. It's not Marguerite, but it's encouraging. And soon they have the reward thereafter. Got her, got her, got her, got her. We got her. Big one. We have big one. 400. 400. The telltale signal is coming from close to the rugged shore. Where is she? Lost her again. Had it, definitely had it. She's in, in here. It appears Marguerite may have gone around the next point but the big female is there with at least one other shark. Found a man, found her. Yeah, up in a minute. All right, let's see if we can find a bit closer in there, eh? Yeah, yeah, bloody brilliant, the back of the island. The southern coast of the island is a precipitous wall of rock pounded by ocean swells. But the big shark may be attracted by that very feature. Beneath the swells, a 30-foot deep school of fish offers rich feeding for wily adult seals she'd find too hard to catch in the bay. 
but which couldn't escape her here. You've got those big swells coming in, and a seal, not even a seal, how well it can swim, could actually survive getting up onto those rocks yeah. or those big swells. Yeah. It kind of makes a bit of sense that that would, in fact, be a good area for the shark to, to hunt, because seals can't get away if it catches them. Strong signal. Now she hangs off between She's just hanging around here. in the bay there. Now she's come back strong. There must be a big wall or something in there that she gets behind. For six hours, they track Marguerite constantly cruising up and down the submarine wall in repeated sweeps. 50 meters out. She appears to be hunting from the cover of the murky white water of the surf zone, known as the bubble curtain. Lost it, she was heading over in that direction. Over there, was she? Yeah, she could have gone around the, the point. Tracking the tracking data indicates the shark is patrolling less than a mile of coast in what looks like a deliberate strategy. Again, it is where deep water takes her within yards of the shore. She is less than two miles away from the main group, always within easy reach and potentially constant contact. It's a remarkable insight into great white behavior. Not only have they twice found white sharks apparently maintaining close social groupings, Marguerite's behavior now resembles that of a matriarch with a pack of youngsters. As they return to the main bay, the yeah. remainder of the group is waiting. How's that? Get back into Shark Bay and drive over the top of one while you're finding a place to put your anchor. <laughs> For eight days now, the adolescent sharks have remained in the same area, seemingly not tempted by other large seal colonies further south. Yeah, just past us here. There's no, no real sense in them sort of cruising all the way down six, six or eight miles down to South Neptune Island and turn around and come back and then it seems logical to stay a little bit more site specific to a seal colony when, you, when you're a bigger shark than to actually become very transient and move around all over the place and chew up a lot of energy. We've actually got a shark getting a lot on the bait. The shark group's behavior strongly points to this being an established pack moving together and hunting together. To find numerous white sharks remaining together for extended periods, both here and in the Chatham Islands, suggests patterns of social interaction that could overturn current scientific ideas of white shark behavior and intelligence. Pack behavior implies a level of communication beyond anything previously recognized. And Craig and Ian are convinced there is a clear element of pre-planning in their hunting. The question is no longer, are white sharks intelligent? Only, how intelligent? The nature of science is to have an open mind. And, um, and as we find, like that would have been laughed down big time three, four, five years ago today with what we've been finding. Yeah. Lately, nothing's impossible. You know, all of a sudden, nothing's impossible. And with white sharks, one of their main prey items is actually uh, marine mammal. Mm. And marine mammals are incredibly intelligent animals uh, in comparison to, to 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 the animal kingdom. So, so to be able to hunt effectively on on those animals, which are supposedly one step ahead, they have to also have some pretty decent brain function as well. As Kinna Scully returns to the Chatham Islands, the nature of the white shark is emerging as more complex than he ever imagined. He can only hope local authorities soon allow divers access to cages and other protection offered in South Australia. In the long term, further study may reveal other options. Like wolves, it is now clear white sharks have intelligence and definable strategies for hunting. In time, we may come to understand the ways of these creatures that work by strategy and find a way to live with them.
for like wolves, white sharks are important in the balance of life and we should respect their role as top predators as much as we fear their bite.